Today on Beerus TV, we're gonna feed some corals. Hey guys, my name is Ryan. Welcome to another week of the Beerus 160, where every week we do our best to help you guys, members of the reefing community, enjoy your tanks and find new ways to explore the hobby. We do that by following the setup and progression of this 160 gallon reef tank. This week we're gonna talk feeding corals. Do corals require feeding to survive in the reef tank? What are the perceived benefits associated with feeding? Are these benefits achievable, worth the time or effort? What are the different types of food and how do you feed them? So do corals require direct feedings in the reef tank? I think the most basic answer is generally no. Most common corals will survive just fine off of good lighting and particulate foods generated from feeding the fish. However, simple survival isn't the only goal in the reef tank. Most of us want to maximize growth, health, and support metabolic functions like tissue repair and the ability to fend off disease or parasites. So the real question isn't do you need to feed corals to have a successful reef tank because I think we all know that to not be the case. It's can we use food to promote healthier, faster growing and disease resistant reef tanks. So the question really comes down to are corals autotrophic or heterotrophic feeders? In this case autotrophic means self-feeding organisms that can produce complex organic compounds like fats, carbohydrates and proteins on their own using common environmental energy sources like sunlight. Or corals heterotrophs mean they capture and feed on other organisms like plankton, bacteria, suspended particulates, or prey as sources of fats, carbohydrates, and proteins required for metabolic function. Corals are unique in that many can have both autotrophic and heterotrophic traits, meaning they can produce their own energy using symbiotic zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are single-celled protozoans which live within the corals and utilize nutrients abundant within the coral's tissue like carbon dioxide and light. The zooxanthellae use light and CO2 to produce glucose, glycerol, and amino acids as part of photosynthesis, which is released into the coral's tissue and utilized for metabolic functions like respiration, mucus production, tissue repair, tissue growth, and reproduction, generally speaking in that order. However, most corals also have polyps which are capable of capturing prey, which can be broken down into these nutrients and utilized for the same purposes. So in effect, most corals in the reef aquarium are animals with mouths capable of capturing prey. It might be best described as heterotrophs with strong autotrophic characteristics because they have a close relationship with autotrophic zooxanthellae, which lives inside their tissue and provides much of the coral's nutrition as a byproduct of photosynthesis. So the big question is how much of the required nutrients are provided by the zooxanthellae and how much of it comes from capturing prey. That's going to vary wildly from species to species, but with common corals in our reef tanks, the answer is most of the energy and nutrients are being provided by the light. As we mentioned earlier, most of the corals do just fine with adequate light and capturing broken down particles or dissolved nutrients from the addition of fish foods in the tank. So why are there a hundred coral foods on the market? Well, there is some truth to the fact that if you make it, they will buy it. Meaning if you put an awesome coral on the front of the packaging with a bunch of awesome claims, most of us will at least consider buying it. That said, it's been pretty well documented there are very real benefits to feeding corals and providing them additional nutrients for biological function. In most cases, it's commonly believed that more than half of the coral's energy is spent on respiration alone, and there's some important components of protein production which are either not provided or adequately provided by photosynthesis alone and can be limiting factors in important biological processes. So feeding your corals can provide additional resources and energy for tissue growth, general health, and additional calcification or faster skeletal growth. There are various ways corals can commonly capture nutrients or prey. The polyps, tentacles, or sweepers directly capturing the prey and ingesting it. They can also uptake dissolved organic matter directly through their soft tissue cell walls. And the coral's mucous membrane can capture prey or even stream out mucus into a larger array to capture the prey. Each coral is very different in relation to this, how they capture prey as well as how dependent they are on nutrition sources like this. To give you an idea of how this all comes together, we're going to share some data from a study done by the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and Coral Farming Effects of Light, Water, Motion, and Artificial Foods. The study produced some interesting results on water flow and various light intensities, particularly in relation to more is not always better, the right amount is better. For instance, while parietes grew slightly faster at over 1200 par, it really wasn't that much faster than par levels much lower at 457, and the difference between 457 and 145 was negligible. With Montibora, the coral actually grew faster at a par of 82 than the highest range, and at a par of 457 and 145, they performed almost exactly the same in relation to growth. Definitely seems to be a point of diminishing returns with adding more light, and adding more light doesn't mean more nutrients and more growth. So additional light doesn't necessarily mean the zooxanthellae are going to produce more nutrients or energy for the coral. 
Too much light could actually harm the process with many corals. In relation to feeding, they had some pretty compelling results with artificial coral foods and two experiments based on feeding Montipora, Parietes, and Pacillopora various artificial foods. Almost all the foods experienced increased growth over the control with Montipora, the most notable being reef chili and reef roids. Reef chili in particular ended the 12-week experiment with 24% more growth by weight and 47% increase in displacement or size, much higher than the control of natural seawater. I think pretty much any reefer would consider that much additional growth success and probably worth the time and expense. Reef chili and reef roids are also the only foods that produce growth with Pacillopora. Even the university's control experienced negative growth. This is just conjecture, but this could be an indicator that the energy and nutrients provided by the reef chili and reef roids were helping the corals overcome other stressful environmental elements, replacing nutritional elements missing from the filtered seawater used for the study, since natural seawater and two of the other foods resulted in negative growth. Reef roids is also the only food that resulted in increased growth with parietes over the control. I think the University of Hawaii's results match generally accepted theory that corals absolutely do benefit from the natural behavior of capturing prey, even artificial foods, and the net result is better overall health and in turn growth. However, that doesn't mean that every product out there works as described, and it absolutely doesn't mean that more is better. In relation to that, the university also studied the effects of larger doses on four other common coral foods. The results were pretty disappointing, and in almost every case, the controls of filtered seawater outperformed the foods at a normal dose, and adding more actually slowed growth. End of the day, there are a lot of coral foods on the market, and I'd say the general feeling in the hobby is using coral foods isn't worth the time and expense, but this is probably more based on the experience with fairly popular but underperforming products. If your goal is to grow corals faster and improve general health, I don't think there's any question with many types of corals it's absolutely possible with the right selection and use of foods. One other note in relation to dosages, not only is more not necessarily better, but just like fish food, they're all adding nutrients to the water, which can lead to algae growth and poorer quality water over time. So results in relation to nutrients out of the tank is something to consider. So while in this study the reef chili and reef roids both performed well, the dose of reef chili was about one-tenth the weight. The amount you need to add to achieve results is pretty relevant to the overall water quality. So how do you select the right coral food? I guess there are a few elements starting with the right claims and the right results. Make sure to read what the food claims to achieve and only continue using it if you're achieving the results you're looking for. The first step in that is either reading the reviews or asking the reefing community what they think on the forums. Unless you're a pro, there's no need to be a trailblazer. Emulating other successes is a lot easier. Next component is the right size food for the right size coral polyp. Corals have a huge range of polyp sizes designed to capture anything from microscopic particles to larger meaty foods like mysis shrimp. Large polyps like acans and duncans do best with meaty foods. I will share that even if they're willing to take larger pieces, smaller pieces are likely just better. It's easier to break down smaller, less complex pieces into the desired nutrients. In fact, it's pretty common to feed larger polyps like this pellet foods, which rapidly break down and very nutrient dense. Sometimes even pellets which have been fortified with additives like Selco or amino acids. I think anyone who takes the time to feed their acans or larger coral polyps will say they see some pretty dramatic increases in growth. However, smaller polyp corals are a bit different. It's pretty hard to know what size food particles are designed to capture and ingest. In most cases, it's not something you can see with your eye, and even if you did know, it's unlikely you're going to feed them all separate foods. This is one of the benefits of reef chili. For those of you that don't know, reef chili is the very first product we designed for the reefing community and the grandfather of bulk reef supply. More or less, no one wants to buy a dozen expensive foods to feed all the corals in your tank. Reef chili is just a simple blend of many successful foods with zooplankton, phytoplankton, copepods, rotifers, daphnia, spirulina, and a baby brine shrimp replacement diet. Net result is an inexpensive, nutrient-rich coral food that spans a micron range from one to almost a thousand, so there's something for almost every coral polyp in the tank. Another brand that does dry coral foods well is Fauna Marin with their pellets designed specifically for corals rather than fish, sea fan, clam, zoanthid, and liquid plankton foods. Similar to those liquid plankton foods, Doc Eco Eggs are probably one of the most popular liquid coral foods. 
There are also some frozen small particle options, which in terms of nutrition and palatability fall somewhere between dried foods and live. Hikari offers a whole variety of frozen foods with their coral gumbo, ocean plankton, baby brine shrimp, rotifers, and cyclopods. If you're interested in the particle size, we took some close-up shots if you want to check each out on our website. Keep in mind that all these coral foods are more or less replacements for live foods. It's absolutely possible to culture live foods and dose them to the tank. The payoff probably just isn't worth all the effort of maintaining all these cultures. It is cool, so sometime in the future we do have a detailed video planned on culturing live foods like phytoplankton, rotifers, and copepods for your corals. It takes up a lot of space and effort, but it can be a really fun project and extension of the hobby. Beyond the small particle foods, there's also dissolved nutrient foods, primarily various forms of amino acids. These are all absorbed directly through their tissue. Biggest benefit is the corals don't have to spend metabolic energy to break them down. They're also providing missing or low availability amino acids that zooxanthellae are unable to provide in sufficient quantities. There are dozens of different brands of amino acids. I check out the reviews and select the ones where the most reefers are getting the results they're looking for. I'll touch on my favorite three, starting with the Red Sea Reef Energy A and B combo, which is a mix of vitamins, various amino acids, carbohydrates, and fatty acids, and probably one of the most popular coral food combinations. Josh's tank is a pretty good example of a fast growing tank that was using Red Sea's reef energy. I'd personally also consider the HW Biotip Amino Acids and Biocatalyst just because it's a brand of salt I trust and use. It's also one of the most affordable amino acid options. We put together a nice kit of HW products to go with the salt, which is a solid way to try out the HW line. On the BRS 160, we're using KZ Coral Foods with amino acid concentrate LPS and Poles Coral Vitalizer and Reef Chili for particulate foods. KZ has one thing that none of the other coral foods have, which is a robust community of users who are more than willing to share all their successes and challenges with each of the products, a community built on reefers' successes. One of the main reasons why more and more reefers are gravitating over to their line over time if you're interested in trying a few out, the two we are using is a good start of the Nano Power Package is an easy way to try out a few of them at the same time. Okay, so how do you feed all these foods? I think it's mainly summed up by broadcast and target feeding. Broadcast feeding means simply adding some to the tank and letting the corals capture what they can. It's pretty common with smaller particle foods like frozen Hikari coral foods, reef chili, or reef roids. If possible, this is best done with the return pump turned off and the power heads on fairly low. This is where the feed mode with most controllers and most DC pumps like the Vortex or Tunes pumps come in handy. Basically, after you add the food, you want to give the corals time to capture it. Longer the better, but most reefers will find that longer than 15 minutes isn't very realistic. It's really up to you. If your pumps don't have a feed mode or you don't have a controller, I would personally never unplug anything with the assumption that you'll plug it back in later because eventually you'll get distracted and forget. Some of the food going down the overflow and removed by the skimmer or settling out in the sump is not that big of a deal. This is where target feeding comes in. The feeding bottle for reef chili is a nice way to direct food towards the coral. Try not to blast it directly, but use the current of the tank to slowly blow food in its general direction. Same squeezable bottle can be used for small particle frozen foods or other dry powder-like foods. The bottle is particularly useful for rehydrating dry foods so they don't float around as easy. If you're using slightly larger particles, feel free to cut the tip off and make the opening larger. You can also attach the bottle to some airline tubing to reach harder to reach areas in the tank or even rigid tubing to keep your arm dry during target feeding. Many reefers will also use anything from a clear solo cup to a two liter bottle to create closed off feeding zones and make it easier for the coral to capture foods and keep the shrimp, crab, and fish out while they pull the foods in. There's some commercial feeding tools like Julian's thing, which looks awkward, but actually pretty convenient. Skims make some nice coral feeders. Dosing syringes work well, but by far the most common tool for coral feeding is a turkey baster. Mix the food up in a cup, squeeze it in, and target feed your corals. As we mentioned earlier, larger polyp corals like acans, blastos, dunkins, pallies, and some zoanthids are capable of eating larger meaty foods. I always try and feed them mysis because it seems to be the right size. You can also do this by hand or just turkey baste them with some mysis. Note that fish and shrimp are going to try to go after it so that two liter bottle trick works well. Another option for getting the fish to be less interested is the Fauna Marin LPS food which has a natural bitterant in it so the fish are less likely to go after it. Foods like this and Fauna's Recordia zoanthid food are super new nutrient dense, so if your corals accept them, it's likely to be an excellent nutritional source. I note that while this is called a Recordia and zoanthid food, some have an active feeding response that are easy to trigger while others don't. 
So while palates have a pretty active feeding response, zoanthids are much more finicky. The fauna marin food is actually designed to be used in conjunction with the Ultraman D. That combo is much more likely to get a feeding response from more finicky corals. All those amino acids and similar liquid products can be added directly to the tank. You can elect to turn off your skimmer for an hour or so after dosing, but not if you're going to forget to turn it back on. It's not a critical step, but nice to do if you have a controller with a feeding mode capable of that. Last bit to all this is most corals are best fed at night, so if it's not super inconvenient for you, either before or after the lights come on can be the most effective time. Last week we asked all of you what your favorite coral mounting method is, and super glue was a landslide winner. This week we're asking your thoughts on coral feeding, low value or best thing you've ever done. If you learned something new today, help us out with a quick thumbs up and subscribe so you don't miss out on next week's episode, week 40, the Beerus 160 review, where the tank is at and how it's doing.